Layouts for packaging. In this lesson, we will define what a die line is and identify uses for die lines in the commercial printing and graphics industries. We'll walk through the process of creating a professional die line using industry standard software like Adobe InDesign and Illustrator, and then you'll get to practice creating your own die line by drawing it by hand. Once we understand what a die line is, we will begin to estimate the cost of a die line by calculating the total amount of metal needed to recreate the die and then multiplying the total amount of metal required by the price per inch of the metal. This will give us an approximate cost that we can pass on to our client. So what is a die line? A die line is the blueprint for a layout that is formed by either a die cutter, a printer, or a graphic designer. It indicates where cuts, folds, and perforations will be in a finished design. A die line is used by a die cutting company to make the wood and metal template that will be used to make complex cuts. A pocket folder, as illustrated in the second example below, is an example of a job that must be cut to size using a die line. The pockets and glue tabs of the pocket folder must be die cut to size. They cannot be trimmed using a regular paper cutter because regular paper cutters only make straight cuts. They're called guillotine cutters. A die works like a cookie cutter by stamping down on a sheet of paper to cut it to the unique size and shape needed for whatever it is producing. A die line represents where metal is required to make a cut, a score, which is an indent in the paper in anticipation of a fold, or perforations, which are created so that you can tear something out of a product. If you look at the example to the right, every line represents where metal is necessary. The solid lines will be cut to form the outside of the object. The interior lines are dashed to represent where the object will fold. We call these scoring lines in the printing industry. A die line usually includes the outside lines needed to cut out an item, but it doesn't necessarily have to. Die lines can be used for scoring, to create scoring fold lines, or to add slits or cuts into an otherwise regularly shaped item. And by regularly, I mean cut to a 90 degree angle like an eight and a half by 11 inch sheet of paper. Die lines represent perimeter and contour lines. They do not represent area. If we're talking about area, the paper represents the area of the object that we're creating. The die line just represents the perimeter or the outline that needs to be cut to create the product. Die lines are used for many different reasons in the commercial graphics industries. As illustrated on the previous slide, you can make pocket folders um, so that you can create something that has a pocket and put additional things inside. You can also use it for packaging and there's all different types of packaging that you could create. You could even make fancy business cards. We should just call these expensive business cards, uh, but still uh, they make your business cards stand out and they're unique and someone might remember it because it's unique. You can make door hangers or complex book cover designs that require a custom cut because there's a hole or window in the cover or the whole book is cut to a specific size. Envelopes are cut with uh, a die line because they have to be cut with flaps that are then folded to and assembled into the envelope. There are many more examples of things that are made using die lines, but the essence is that if something cannot be cut with a straight line with 90 degree angles, like an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, it must be cut using a die line. When you create a die line, it is important to use common indicators so that whomever you give your file to understands what you're trying to communicate. The three common indicators that you should memorize are a solid line or segment indicates a cut, meaning you want to cut straight through the piece of paper so that you're separating two sides of the paper. A dotted line indicates perforation. So you don't want this to cut all the way through the paper, but you want to puncture it so that it's easy to tear out. And dashed lines indicate folds or scoring lines, and they indicate anywhere that you would want to be able to fold easily uh, to create your package. These are universal indicators and should be used from the inception of a design through thumbnails, uh, roughs, comps, mechanicals, any stage of the process, if you're sharing or communicating a message to someone you're working with or to a service provider that's going to be creating what you're designing, everyone needs to know exactly what your expectations are for the project. It should be noted that if you as a designer are creating a new die line from scratch, 
you should not do it independently and think that it's done and then send it to the printer or to a die maker to make. You should consult with the printing company or the die maker at every step of your process. The printing company and the company that will make the die are experts in these areas and will be able to make recommendations based on technical capabilities of the machines that they have, production requirements. Um, they may be able to make recommendations that will make it easier or more affordable to print and cut your job. And so you wanna consult with them at each step along your design process. Printing companies and die makers also let the, uh, will also let you know if they already have a die that will work for your project. Now, if we go back a slide and we look at these examples, if I'm making the business cards in the bottom left-hand corner, they're not gonna have a die for that. And even if they did, a customer who designed those special business cards is not going to want to share that die with someone else. But there are standard dies for packaging. This is a standard die here for this package. There are standard dies for pocket folders. You can ask the printing company if they have any pre-existing dies that can be used for your project if you're just looking for a generic pocket folder as opposed to a truly unique and custom pocket folder. If that's the case, they'll let you know and they'll let you know how to set up your file to align to the die that they already have. This is an example of a typical two panel, one pocket folder. It is an example of what the die line might look like for that, depending on the different features of the die line. As you can see from this example, all of the exterior edges, the ones that you would expect to cut straight through the paper, are mapped with solid lines to indicate that you plan to do a cut. The interior lines are all dashed, indicating that they will be scored for folding. When you glance at this, you should be able to tell that there will be three folds, one down the middle, one across the pocket, and one on this glue flap. I also want to note, even though it's not especially important for this course, that when you create a pocket folder, the glue flap may be attached to the pocket as illustrated here, or it may be attached to the body of the pocket folder. And so I've kind of made it grayed out or pinked out. Um, so that you can see that you can put it in either place, um, but you would want to consult with the printing company, the die maker, to see what their preference is. Once you've established that you are going to have a product or an object that needs custom cutting, there are two approaches that you can take. The first is that you are designing to someone else's template. In this case, you will receive a die line template from your client or from the die cutting company or the printing company that's telling you how to set up your file. It will be in either Adobe InDesign or Illustrator, and then you can make sure that what you're designing fits into the template that they give you. If a template does not already exist or there's not already a die for you, um, you will create a custom die line that you will package with your designs so that you are communicating exactly where you want your cuts to be made. If you receive a template from a client, it may look something like what you see on screen here. This is a template, it's not actually for die cutting, but this is a template for business cards. And so they'll give you a file and says, that will say place the information for your business cards into the grids that we're providing for you. If it was a die line for a custom cut, or a template for a custom cut business card, it would also be set up for the dies as well. When you are ready to create your own custom die line, you need to create it in a standardized way so that when you send your files to the commercial printer, you are communicating effectively to them that they receive the, the file in the way that they need it to be successful for their part of the job. And it will cause frustrations if you just tell them oh, I drew it on a sheet of paper, or I created it, but it's not set up properly. And so the way that you're gonna set up a die line properly is by using industry standard software like Adobe InDesign or Illustrator. You should not use Photoshop to create a die line. It's not what it's intended for. Ideally, die lines should be made in Illustrator, but it's common to make them in InDesign when it's applicable for the project that you're working on. So in addition, I just wanna note that I'm gonna walk through the entire process to commit to create a commercial grade die line in this lecture, but you do not have to create your die line for Art 1210 in InDesign or Illustrator. If you are new to computer graphics or you don't have access to the Adobe software, you can draw your die line by hand in this course and that's completely acceptable. 
However, you will be making die lines in other courses throughout your studies if you're taking computer graphics courses, and in those courses, you will have to follow these instructions. When you're ready to create a commercial grade die line, the first thing you need to do is you need to create a new document, and that document needs to be the size that you need it to be for your project. We talk about finished size and flat size in the graphic arts industry. This document needs to be big enough that the flat size or the open flat size of the package or the box or the uh, pocket folder that you're making will fit on the sheet. You can do this in either Adobe InDesign or Illustrator. I'm going to show you in InDesign, but the steps are the same for Illustrator. Step two, once you've created a new document, you need to set up your layers panel to accept the new die line. Die lines should always be on their own layer. So you're going to create a new layer, rename it die line, or something that is very specific that you're communicating to someone else. So if you want to call it a cut line or a trim line, that's fine. But if it has scoring, it should be called die line. And then you're going to relocate it so it's at the top of your layers panel. So for those of you that are familiar with InDesign and Illustrator, you will open the layers panel, which is the window menu and then layers. At the bottom of the layers panel, there's an icon to create a new layer. It may look like this. It may look slightly different in the newer versions of Adobe Creative Cloud. You will press it to create a new layer. You can see in this example, it automatically created a new layer too. You can double click on the word layer two. It will launch the layers options dialog where you can rename the layer die line and you can select OK. If your die line layer is not at the top of your layers panel, you should click it and drag it visually up so that it is always at the very top of your layers panel. Step three, when you are creating your die line, you must create it using a spot color because spot colors are able to be output as color separations and will be able to isolate the die line from the rest of your artwork. I know that that's probably very confusing for some of you who haven't taken graphics courses before, but essentially when you create color in a graphic arts program, you can create what's called a process color or a spot color. Process colors are colors that are made up of more than one color to create the illusion of another color. So on a computer screen, we use red, green, and blue wavelengths of light to create all of the other colors that you see. Like I see magenta and I see yellow and I see black on the screen right now but the only three colors the screen is projecting at me are red, green, and blue. When you blend wavelengths of light together, you can create additional colors. That's a little bit harder to understand than printing process colors, which are cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. They're basically red, green, um, red, blue, and yellow, like the primary colors you would use when you paint. And with printing process colors, you only print with four colors, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, but you can create purples and oranges and greens. Um, to create them, you would use different levels of cyan, magenta, yellow, and black to recreate the illusion of that color. A spot color is a color in addition to a process color. So if I wanted to, to print purple, I could print some amounts of magenta and cyan to create purple or I could buy purple ink. If I buy purple ink it's a spot color. If I use a blend of cyan, magenta, yellow, and black to create that color um, on paper then it's considered a process color. The reason that this is important is because when we output our artwork we're going to uh, output the artwork one direction. So I'm pushing my left hand to the side. We're, we're going to send the artwork to the left and we're going to take the die line and we're going to separate it and we're going to send it to the right and we're going to send it to the die maker and they're going to go two different directions and by isolating it as its own color and not using that color anywhere else in the design we're going to be able to separate it and pull it apart and say the die maker gets the die line the printer gets the artwork and then we'll come back together and we use that giant die line cookie cutter to stamp the sheet and cut it into different shapes when you create a uh, spot color in InDesign, what I would recommend is that you select any swatch that's already on your swatches panel and then hit the new swatch icon at the bottom. So you can see here I grabbed this blue swatch and then I hit the new icon at the bottom. It immediately will duplicate, so now I have two blue colors. Double click the square, not the words because that will let you rename the color. Double click the little square icon and it will launch the swatch options dialog. In here, you cannot give it a swatch name 
until after you change the color type from process to spot. Once you do that, you can rename your dye line uh, color. I recommend dye line. Some people will name it trim, cut line, whatever it happens to be, but label it so that on your swatches panel, visually you can see that that's the dye line color because you cannot use that color anywhere else in the design. In my example here, the dye line is black. There is also registration in black on that swatches panel. Those are different colors because I could select them differently on the layers panel. I can still use black even though my dye line is black, but I cannot use the black and link it to the dye line. Speaking about colors of dye lines, it does not matter what color your dye line is. The dye line can be any color as long as it is a spot color and you are not using it anywhere else in the design except for your dye line. In general, you want to pick a color that contrasts with the color in your artwork so it's easy for you to see. Some companies have standard colors that they use for their dye lines. So if you're working with a company and they tell you that they like the dye line to be a teal color, then make it a teal color. But what matters more than anything else is that your dye line must be a spot color. You can visually check that on the swatches panel because, as highlighted here, the second to last column in your line of your color uh, will switch from being what appears to be a little gray box to having a circle in it. If you look really close at those little gray boxes, they're actually not gray, it's a series of dots and they represent halftone dots. When we print with process colors, we print with halftones. So when it switches to be the circle, that's indicating to us that it's going to be a spot color. If you're interested in learning more about spot colors, I've provided some links here, but it's not essentially important for our process uh, for Art um, 1210. What I really just want you to understand about dye lines is why we, why we would use them and the general process for creating them in a digital graphics software program. You can see both of the images on, um, on the bottom half of the slide are created using multiple colors. The image on the left is an example of spot colors because there's only two. We're not printing cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And you can see that they've broken it out as a color separation to illustrate everywhere the black color will print on the left and everywhere the yellow color will print on the right. The idea is that if we also had a dye line on this, we would end up with three color separations. So we would have solar, all the black text, power, all the yellow visuals, and then we would have a third color separation which just shows the dye line, the outline of where it's going to cut, so that we can then make printing plates for the black and the yellow, send them to the printer, and the printer is going to make printing plates and print it, but we can send the dye line to a dye maker to create the outline of what you're going to cut. The image on the right is an example of a color separation for a four color process image, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. If you look at the image that it's creating, it's using orange and a yellowy beige color and purple. And those are not colors that are included in cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. But because they have overlapped, let's just look at the magenta and the cyan, They've printed some of that coral in cyan, and they've printed some of that coral in magenta. When you overlap those two colors together, they will blend visually on the page, and you will create the illusion of purple. They have not used purple ink, they have not used orange ink, but they've created an artwork where you look at that and say, I see purple and I see orange. So getting back to making a dye line, now that we have our own layer for the dye line, it's at the top of the layers panel, and we've created a spot color, we're going to physically make the dye line on the page. So step four is to create the dye line, and to do that, you are going to use one point or thinner solid dashed and dotted lines to indicate where your item, in this case, in this example, a pocket folder, needs to cut, fold, and perforate. Um, you should get into the habit of considering folds scores. So I would say in the printing industry where it, it cuts, where it scores, and where it perforates, or perfs is probably what we would say. You can do this using any vector art um, tool. I recommend using the pen tool and the line tool. They work best in InDesign and in Illustrator. Once you've created those lines uh, called strokes, you're going to use the strokes panel and you can change the thickness of the line, you can, take, you can change the type of the line, which makes it solid, dashed, dotted, etc. Um, and then as a little caveat here, my instructions are to use one point or thinner. A one point stroke is perfectly fine for a die line, 
but historically dye lines are created using what's called a hairline stroke. I can't speak for Illustrator because I don't use it that much, um, but in InDesign there is no option when you create a line to choose hairline anymore. But hairline is equal to 0.25 points. So if you wanted to, like right here, I can see that my stroke is one point. Um, you could just highlight that and type 0.25 and use a 0.25 um, point thick uh, line for your dye line. Once you have created a dye line, so now you have all the strokes and all the outlines to create the shape that you want. You use solid lines for cuts dashed lines for folds, dotted lines for perforations. You have to go one step further and set your die line to be an overprint. In graphics, your artwork can be a knockout or an overprint, and vector art is a knockout by default, which is illustrated on the left-hand side of this slide. When you are printing, if you print, let's say, yellow, let's say you print the yellow rectangle that you see on this slide, and then you try to print a color over the top of it, like magenta. Anywhere magenta overlaps yellow, the colors are going to blend together and they are going to appeal to appear to be orange. So if I was if I was trying to print the word solar over top of yellow, and black is probably not the best example because black's kind of a bully and it would print over it anyway. Let's pretend it was magenta. If I was printing bright pink the word solar in bright pink over yellow, it wouldn't be bright pink, it would be orange because the yellow and the magenta would blend together. So by default, your graphic art software will set it up to be a knockout, which means it would leave a hole everywhere in that rectangle where pink or magenta ink has to hit white paper so that when the magenta or the pink ink hits the white paper, it would stay bright pink. Now, by default, it's going to do that for us, but if we leave our artwork as in knockout, whether it is the text that you see or the dye line that you've created, it has a hole under it that doesn't print, so you always have white paper showing through. When we create our dye line, we're going to send the artwork, the pictures, one direction to the left to get printed, and then we are going to take the die line separately and send that to the right to the die maker to make a die. If we print the artwork without the die line and it's set to be a knockout, there will be a white unprinted outline of our pocket folder or our package or our custom business card shape when we print the sheets of paper as a printing company. And we don't want that. We want it to print as if the die line's not even there. So we need to set all of our die lines to be what's called an overprint, which means basically don't leave an empty hole under the artwork. Just print this color right over the top of the others. To do that, you need to select, so you'll go back to your InDesign or your Illustrator file, and you will select all of the lines that you see on the screen here for this specific example. Make sure they're all active and they're all highlighted. And then you need to open the Attributes panel, which in InDesign you can open by going to the Window menu, Output, and then Attributes. And because a die line is made with strokes as opposed to fill colors, you will not have the option to make it an overprint fill, but you will be able to activate overprint stroke. And then that will change all of the strokes in your die line to print right over the top of your artwork, meaning when you print the artwork it won't have a hole under it where the die line should be. After you have created all of your die line, all of the elements of your die line, and you've set it to overprint, the last thing you should do is you should lock that layer because the only thing on your die line layer should be your die line. This makes it easier to go back for editing purposes. It also makes it so you don't accidentally move artwork around on it. It also makes, sure, makes it so you don't accidentally um, delete items on your die line. Uh, it can be very helpful. So make sure your die line is the very top layer on your layers panel. Make sure that it's locked so you're not putting anything else on it and make sure it's always sent to overprint stroke. Now that you've created it, you can create all of the artwork on any other layers that you want. So create as many layers as you want. In this example, there's one extra layer and I've renamed it design layer, but you could have 50 different layers if you wanted, um, as long as they are below the die line layer visually on your layers panel. Now that we have a 
basic or a generic understanding of what a die line is, let's make a connection to math. We're going to connect perimeter to die lines. And then once we understand what perimeter is, we will use that to calculate the total amount of metal needed in a die by adding perimeter to all the interior lines. But I'm getting ahead of myself, so let's start with perimeter. Perimeter is the total distance around the outside of a two-dimensional shape or object. Perimeter is calculated by adding the sum of all sides of a two-dimensional shape or object. It only accounts for the outside edges of the shape, nothing on the inside. The perimeter of a square in the example below is calculated by adding 4 plus 4 plus 4 plus 4 equals 16. The best way to calculate perimeter is to pick one side of the shape and then add all of the values around the shape in either a continuous clockwise or counterclockwise direction. In this example, all the sides are the same length, but they won't always be. So pick one, maybe the top one, and choose clockwise or counterclockwise, and then just keep adding as you go around. So 4 plus 4 plus 4 plus 4. Perimeter and simple math can be used to calculate the total amount of metal required to construct a die cutting die. The steps that we're going to use to calculate the total amount of metal needed for a die is to calculate the outer perimeter of the die and get that value. Once we have that, we'll calculate all of the interior lines that are needed either to cut, score, or fold on the inside of the die. And then once we have that value, we'll sum them together and that will give us the total amount of metal needed. Once we know the total amount of metal needed, we can use a very basic formula to calculate the price of the die. And that is the number of inches that we are creating out of our die times the price per inch of the metal. So if we come out to 100 inches for the die, and it's priced at $2 an inch, we can estimate that that die should cost us about $200. The price per inch of metal you'll get from your printing company or from your die maker, and they will say in general it's about $3 or $3.50 or $4 an inch, depending on what they're charging currently. And then that will give you a way to very quickly kind of estimate how much it should cost for your die. So let's first practice perimeter. What is the total perimeter of this die line? If we walk through it together, we can pick one spot on the pocket folder to start, and we'll go around the entire outside adding up all the values. I like to write them down, so even though um, I have typed them out in this slide, um, I would write them on a piece of paper as I was doing this so I could double check. I never, I never trust myself to add things right on my calculator so I always double and triple check and I would highly recommend doing that yourself because uh, if you add the numbers twice and get two different answers if you add it a third then you can hopefully figure out which of those two attempts was was not right so let's pick a spot I'm gonna pick this top left hand corner so if I was gonna calculate the perimeter of this pocket folder I would literally on a piece of paper write 9 plus 9 plus 12 plus one, plus three and a five, plus three and a half, plus one. When I get to the length of the pocket, it doesn't tell me, so I have to do some basic deductions to figure out is the same width as the panel, which is nine. So I'd say plus nine, plus four. Again, I have another length that doesn't have a value, but up here it tells me it's nine inches. So plus nine, plus 12. When you write that down, you get nine plus nine plus 12, plus one, plus three and a half, plus one plus 9, plus 4, plus 9, plus 12. And when you sum that together, it comes out to 69.5. In this example, I did not include any of the interior lines in my calculation because perimeter only includes the outermost edges of the two-dimensional shape or object. When we go to calculate the total price of the die, we're going to add those interiors, interior lines in, but for now, we're just practicing perimeter. Give this next example a try on your own. What is the total perimeter of this table tent card? And if you're interested, these are this is like what a die would look like for the table tent cards that you see in restaurants. Like if you go into like Denny's or Chili's or Applebee's and they have those triangle um, tents that sit on the table and one side might have like a dessert special and the other side might say this is our appetizer of the, the month. Um, if you open them up, it would look something like this. So take a minute, figure out what the perimeter of this is, 
and when you are done, push play on the video and we will go through the answer together. In this example, I'm going to pick the top and start writing clockwise what the values are on a piece of paper. I get 28 plus 7. The bottom is 28 inches, even though it doesn't tell us. I can figure it out because it's the same as the top. I'm going to ignore this 13 value because it's green for a reason. It represents the length inside here. The next value is 3. Now I can use that 13 inch plus 1 plus 13 again plus 3. When you add all those values up, you should have gotten 96 inches. If you did not get 96 inches, please give it another try until you're able to successfully calculate the correct answer. If you did get 96, let's keep going. Now that we understand perimeter, we can use that to be able to calculate the total cost of a die line or the creation of a die line. What we'll do is, and I, I uh, explained these on the previous slide, we're going to calculate the outer perimeter of the die line. Once we have that, we'll calculate the total length of all the interior lines needed for the die, and then we'll add them together. Once we have the total amount of metal needed, we'll then multiply that times the cost per inch of the metal, or the estimated cost per inch of the metal. So let's walk through an example together. We have the same pocket folder from the previous example, so we've already calculated the distance around the outside. So what are we going to do to calculate the total cost of the die? So step one is to calculate the total perimeter cost, and if we go back, it was 69.5. To calculate that, we added 9 plus 9 plus 12 plus 1 plus 3.5 plus 1 plus 9 plus 4 plus 9 plus 12. In addition to that, we need to add, let's walk through it together, we need to add all of the interior lines, and in this case, there's only three. They're not labeled, so we have to figure out the lengths, but it's pretty straightforward. The height of the pocket folder, it tells us on both sides is 12, so we'll add down here 12. The width of the panel is 9, so we'll add 9. And then the only thing that's a little bit tricky is that the height of the pocket is 4, not 3.5. So the whole height is 4. The reason that this length is 3.5 is because it's a tabbed panel that's kind of indented a little bit. And so the correct answer for all of the interior lines is 12 plus 9 plus 4, and that equals 25. We can then sum those two values together. So the perimeter that we calculated previously is 69.5, and then we, when we add 25 to it for the interior lines, we have a total of 94.5 inches of metal required to produce this one pocket folder die line. In the example, it tells us that the metal is priced at $1.50 um, $1 per inch. So then we can take 94.5 inches and multiply it times $1.50 per inch, and that gives us a total cost of the die to be $141.75. Now that assumes that we're making one pocket folder. If it was a two-up pocket folder die, meaning there's two of them side by side, it would be $141.75 times two. Try this one on your own. In this case, we're going to use the same table tent uh, die line design, and it's going to be priced at $1.25 per inch. Calculate the total perimeter and then the length of all of the interior lines, and then sum that together and multiply it times $1.25 per inch. Pause the video, and when you're ready, move forward, and we'll go through the answer or the calculations together. In this case, we have already calculated the distance around the perimeter. That was 28 plus 7 plus 28 plus 3 plus 13 plus 1 plus 13 plus 3. It came out to 96 inches, and that was on slide 23. In addition to that, we need to add all the interior lines. I'm going to work from right to left because it just feels more intuitive or easier to see what the distances are. So in this example, the height is 7, so I have 7 plus 7. Over here, I'm not going to add 7 again because it doesn't continue all the way through the pocket, um, all the way through the design. So instead, I have to recognize that the height of these flaps are 3 inches. So it's 7 plus 7 plus 3 plus 3. When I add that together, I get 14 plus 6 equals 20. When we add 96 and 20, we get the total amount of metal for the die line to be 116 inches. 116 inches times $1.25 per inch 
means that this die would cost $145. And again, if you're printing multiple of these, it wouldn't just be 145, it would be 145 times however many you're printing on the same sheet of paper. The cost to be calculated for the pocket folder and the table tent card examples only account for what is called a one out in position, meaning only one pocket folder or one table tent card will print per press sheet. If more than one item is printing on each press sheet, you will need to calculate the cost of two or three or more of the same die line. I've created these visuals for you so you can see the outer rectangle represents the press sheet that you would run through your printing press which is the same sheet that you would send through the die cutting press. On the left, we have a two up or two out in position, which means however much one die line cost, we need to multiply it times two. In the second example, it is four out. So whatever the cost of one die line is, we would have to multiply it times four. Keep that in mind. Depending on the quantity of items that you're producing, you might have to print multiple out per sheet just for time's sake to get it printed faster, which means your die cost is going to be more. After completing this lesson, you should be able to identify what a die line is and what it is used for. You should also be able to break down the proper steps needed to create a commercial die line. You don't have to be able to do it, but you should be able to communicate to me what the steps are. You should also be able to create your own custom die line using solid, dashed, and dotted lines. You can use a computer software program if you want to, or you can draw it by hand and you're required to do this for your homework this lesson. So if you're having trouble with this, make sure you attend online office hours. Last, you're able to calculate the amount of metal required to create a physical die, both the perimeter and the interior lines, and then use that information to calculate or estimate um, the cost of a die.